Hey, it's Kev from Blender Binge. Here are 15 camera tricks or things to know that will help you make better looking shots. I've been asked many times by my subscribers to do this video, so here goes. This will be an overview video, not too in-depth, but it can give you ideas and help you break out to the next level, or at least help you know what to research more of. Number one, resolution settings. Yeah, it's boring and all, but here's a quick rundown of knowing your resolutions. The main ones to know at the time of this video are 8K, 4K, 2K, HD 1080p, and HD 720p. Here's a link with lots of other resolutions because the world definitely isn't simple anymore. The link will be in the description. Number two, focal length. Knowing this can help you spice up boring shots and get more cool. Let's start with the difference between wide angle and telephoto. Wide angle is like what you see on GoPro cameras and your iPhone. It's a wide shot. Like this shot of Los Angeles skyline taken from Mulholland or Griffith Park or something. Telephoto is more of a long shot that can be taken from far away, like if you want to shoot a tiger but you don't want to get too much love. This is a shot of downtown LA from a similar vantage point, and it fills the frame with the buildings. And it has the side effect of compressing the foreground and the background. See? Barnsdall and Kaiser are about five miles from downtown, but it doesn't seem like it in this picture, does it? Blender gives us the ability to go from extreme wide angle to extreme telephoto for free. In this scene, I have a camera zeroed out in the middle facing down the y-axis. I have Suzanne and some boxes in a mountain range. If I look through the camera right now, I can see that it's the standard setting of 50 millimeters. Some photographers call this the nifty 50 because it's good for portraits. I call it the default. Watch what happens if I bring this focal length down to say 11. The scene gets really, really wide. Now what happens if I bring it up to like 300? Wow, I can see up her nose and the mountains are right behind her. We know they're not, but horizontal compression is a funny thing. Learning to use different focal lengths for your shots is a good way to break out of the my renders look like everyone else's renders paradigm. Play around and look at photographs for reference. You can learn a lot by doing so. Number three, clipping planes. When you load in some huge models like kit bashing stuff, most of the time you can't see them. If you adjust your clipping planes, it can help. While this is no panacea and can sometimes cause more trouble than it's worth, I generally scale objects down to real world settings to fit the grid and then set clip start to between 0.1 and 1 and end to about 100,000. Does this always work? No, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. But this is a decent starting point and most of the time works pretty well for me at least. Give it a try. Number four, rack focus. This is a really cool effect you see in movies and TV a whole lot. It's when you see the camera focusing on one thing while something else is blurry and then it changes the blurry thing comes into focus while the sharp thing blurs. Here's a quick way to do it. Say you have a camera and a Suzanne and another Suzanne. If you add in an empty and move it forward a bit, you can go to camera settings, check depth of field, and under the focus on object, choose the empty you created a minute ago. Now you have a control. If you go to f-stop and lower the value, then move your empty forward and back, you can simulate the shifting focus based on low depth of field. If you play with different f-stop numbers, you get different results. The lower the f-stop, the shallower your depth of field is, which gives you more blur. Conversely, a higher f-stop gives you a deeper depth of field where more of your scene is always in focus. It's the aperture size. This tutorial doesn't address breathing as that technique is cool but it would add way too much in the weeds to this video. Number five, dolly zoom freak out effect otherwise known as the Hitchcock effect. This was a more common technique back when I was in my 80s. It's the Hitchcock effect and I've seen a few people teach this in various software over the years. You basically change your camera focal length while simultaneously moving your camera in and out. In this scene, I have a bunch of Suzannes and a camera at 000. The trick here is to set a relatively wide angle, like 35 millimeters in this case, then keyframe the camera at 1. I move it back, then keyframe it again at, say, 96, or however fast you want the effect to happen. Now, set keyframes for the focal length. At frame 1, set the focal length to 35 millimeters, and at frame 96, set it to, say, 150 millimeters, which is well into the telephoto range. Now, just adjust your subject to look about the same in the frame and let the magic of the movies happen right before your very eyes. See how it warps based on focal length? Freaky horror movie crap, right? Play with this one and freak out some Instagram people. Number six, framing the shot. Composition is as much an art as it is a science. And here's where you're taking your camera out and practicing photography off of the computer is good for you. If you don't have the patience for that, here's a quick way to make more interesting compositions. It's called the rule of thirds. Many cameras, including the 5D Mark III that I use frequently, has this feature on there. It's a grid that breaks up the viewfinder and allows you to align your shots based on thirds, which makes for more interesting compositions. Blender has this too. It's under Camera Properties, Viewport Display, Composition Guides. There are many here, but thirds is immediately useful, and so is the golden ratio. 
If you turn on thirds, you'll see the grid appear. Let us line up our shots better. This is a shot I did of a Borg interior video that I made a while back. Notice that I have the camera dead center on the central hive. Boring. Watch when I move it to align with one of the left vertical lines. Interesting. It instantly adds some more visual interest. I'd say use these guides to frame up your shots. Any good photography book will help you there. It matters. Number eight, lock camera to view. This one is overlooked, but so useful. Many of you who've been using Blender for a while know this, but it's worth having this in the video. This allows you to hold the camera and frame your shot. By default, if you look through the camera by hitting zero on the keyboard, you'll look through the camera. But the second you try to move, it snaps out. Here's the fix. Go to this little arrow up here or hit N on the keyboard. Then, under the View tab, you'll see the Lock Camera to View checkbox. If you turn this on and hit zero to go back into the camera view, when you move around, it's like you're holding the camera. If you click off of this, all you need to do is select the box and you're back holding the camera. If you don't want this effect on, turn off lock camera to view and it goes away. Simple, right? Helpful? I don't know. You tell me. Number nine, active camera. If you have more than one camera in your scene, it's difficult to switch back and forth. Here's how to do it. I'm in a scene with two cameras. The one with the black triangle is the active one. If you hit zero, you'll go into that camera. If you want to look through the other one, simply select the green camera icon in the outliner. This will allow you to switch back and forth. If I zoom out, you can see the black triangle switching. You can also select the other camera and hit control zero, but this is way easier. Try it. Number 10, camera rig on a path. If you want to make a cool tunnel animation like this one, or this one, you can do it pretty easily. First, zero out your camera by hitting alt G and alt R. Then rotate it up on the X by 90 degrees. Now add in a Bezier circle and scale it up. Then add in an empty and parent your camera to the empty. On the empty, add a follow path constraint. Choose the Bezier circle. Now choose animate path. Your camera now moves around. If you want it to look ahead, duplicate the empty. Then in the constraint properties, change the offset to a negative number. That pushes it forward a bit. Now to make the camera look at that empty, select the camera and add a track to constraint. The target will be the second empty. Make up Y and then set 2 to negative Z. Now hit play and watch in amazement. I have a whole video on this in the link above where I do quite a bit more. Number 11, camera rig tool. This is a cool add-on that allows you to use some useful camera rigs. I have one issue with these that I'll address in the next section of this video, but these simulate real world camera rigs. Make sure to enable the camera rig add-on and edit preferences. Now, if you go to add camera, you have dolly camera rig and crane camera rig. Add in a dolly camera rig. If you select dolly rig in the outliner, you can now go and select the arrow target curve pieces. Move them around and animate them. This gives you some nice dolly type movements that will instantly make your camera moves look a bit better. If you add in a crane rig, you can use this similarly. It simulates a crane jib and does a pretty nice job for free. My only concern with this one is that jibs give you the ability to keep the camera level without needing a target. You can probably turn that off in this rig, but I'll show you how to create a simple one on your own in the next section. Number 12, simple camera jib rig. This is by no means a be all end all rig. It's quick and dirty, and I've been using this type of thing for a long time in other software for some cool establishing shots and other things. Take your camera, hit Alt R and Alt G to zero it out, then rotate it 90 degrees on the X axis. Now, add in an empty and duplicate it. Move the duplicate empty back a bit. Now parent the camera to the first empty, and then parent the first empty to the second empty, the one in the back. Now, if you rotate the back empty, it rotates the whole thing. The camera needs to stay level though, so let's make that happen. Select the front empty, go to the X rotation channel, right click and choose add driver. Simply choose the back empty and in expression type var times negative one. This basically just makes the front empty rotate exactly opposite the back empty. Lastly, under type, choose X rotation, and watch as you rotate the back control empty, the camera stays level. You can always still rotate the camera separately from this rig, and even constrain it to a target with the track to, like we did in the camera path section of this video, but this'll work. Look, I created some more Suzannes, and when I rotate up, I get a nice establishing shot of a Suzanne army. Pretty sweet. Number 13, handheld camera look. This can go way too far in giving you the Blair Witch effect but it's useful for the CSI type handheld camera effect when you want it. Simply set two keyframes on your camera, one at the beginning and one at the end. Now change your timeline to graph editor and open up that little hidden icon on the right side, then choose modifiers. 
I've been doing this for years in other software, but I credit Ian Hubert for bringing out this hidden window in a really funny way. Like, I'm sure you guys have all seen that one, but I digress. In here, you want to expand your channels on the left side for your camera and choose one of the channels. Go back to the right side and choose Add Modifier, Noise. This adds noise to the animation curve. It heads way too much though, so use the scale and strength parameters to really smooth it out. A little bit goes a long way. Once you have done that for each channel you want to have it on, hit play and you get a decent handheld look really quickly. Number 14, Triangle of Exposure. This is more for photography, but understanding this will help broaden your understanding of everything you do in creating animations on the camera and look end. There is a ton of information available on it, but it's all about how much light hits the sensor to create an image and understanding this may help you tremendously. It deals with ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. Balancing each can have a dramatic effect on your images. It's a deep subject and deserves its own video or series of videos, but I wanted to mention it here because it helps. In Blender, understanding this will help with motion blur in regard to shutter speed, depth of field in regard to aperture, and maybe something like gamma in regard to ISO, which is sensor sensitivity. Number 15, control motion blur and depth of field in post. This is the one you guys should probably have been waiting for. So those of you who stuck around to the end, good. This is a huge time saver, and I almost didn't want to include this to teach to some of the useless trolls out there. But the good people outnumber the idiots 99 to 1 on my channel, so here we go. I'm putting out a whole lot more of this stuff on my Patreon this month as well. Go to camera view and set a few keyframes for your animation. Set the render to cycles here. EV works too, but right now it's just a little bit... Nah, just use cycles. Choose where to render to, and make sure you choose multi-layer EXR with RGBA selected. It's better this way. Your files will be much larger, but you'll have more to play with. Before you render, go under View Layer Properties and make sure Z is checked, and then check Vector as well. You can add in denoising data, but that's not really relevant right now. When it's done, go to Compositing, hit Use Nodes, and add in a viewer. Connect the image to it and select it. This shows your renders. Now that's the render layer, not what we want. What we want to do is open the image sequence that we rendered out. To do that, add in an image sequence node, then choose the image sequence you rendered out. Now select the render node and hit M to mute it. Connect the combined out of the image sequence node to the in of the viewer and select the viewer and now we see the animation frames that we rendered out. Here's where we can add in nodes to address motion blur and depth of field. This gives us the ability to control these things interactively. And when we get the added benefit of faster render times, it's really awesome. Add in a vector blur node and drop it on top of the node that connects the combined out of the image sequence node to the input of the viewer. It's that line going across the whole thing. Then connect vector to speed and wow, you get motion blur. You can also control this now a bit. Next, let's add in some depth of field. Add in a defocus node and drop it over the line to connect it. Then connect depth to Z and enable use Z buffer. We now have our aperture controls on a node that we can tweak to our heart's content. To get fun, we can also add a color balance node here and change the color of the cube too. This is really powerful stuff. There's so many possibilities. When you are ready to render, make sure the out is connected to the composite node as well. Choose MP4 or render your movie as files, it doesn't matter, and render away. So there you go, 15 camera tricks and things to know that will help you. I've recently added a whole video explaining how I made this animation from scratch in three hours as a challenge on Daniel Kraft's channel. It's up on my Patreon, as I love giving out tons of content, but there's some stuff I reserve for people who really want to learn and be here. There's also a newsletter and an ebook in the links below if you're interested. So with that, thanks and stay healthy.